Hello everyone. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Good evening. And uh, welcome to Pocket Mentors Facebook Live session. Maraming salamat for everyone who is joining us today and we all hope that you're safe and well at home. Uh, medyo maulan lang nga ngayon but uh, it's nice and cool. I know it's been a while since we got together for something like this but Regardless, we couldn't be happier to be back and be here for everyone who wants to learn something new, practical, and inspiring. Because of that, and that is what Pocket Mentor is all about. Yeah? Okay. Just to refresh everyone's minds as to who Pocket Mentor is or what Pocket Mentor is, for our first-time viewers also who are here, Pocket Mentor is a platform for purposeful learning. And that means you can expect us to bring experts here from various fields and have them share their life experiences and, of course, professional knowledge because we want to help you succeed and lead more fulfilling lives, which is why we're so excited for tonight because tonight we have a very special guest who, by the way, is already an official mentor of Pocket Mentor. Woohoo! All right, so tonight we listen to an associate guru at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business Master in Entrepreneurship Program and a faculty member at the Ateneo Center for Continuing Education and the Ateneo, de, and the Ateneo Manila University. So he is the author, author, okay? He is the author of the book, the Creativity Handbook, A Guide for Future Creatives. He is an expert in management creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, brand strategy, marketing, consumer needs, finding, and whole brain management. Yes, we all have a whole brain in there somewhere. He is <laughs> a co-founder of CIA Bootleg Manila, and the ASEAN Director, Creative Intelligence Associates, Tokyo. Everyone, let's all welcome Mr. Aaron Palileo. Good evening. Thank you, Robbie, for uh, the introduction. Um, I echo your sentiments. I hope everyone out there um, in the comforts of their own homes, I hope you guys are safe. I hope you guys are well. And I hope you guys are ready to talk about creativity and innovation. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about creativity and innovation, which are two things that a lot of people know they need, know they have to practice in, in, in whatever field they're in, whether they're in management, whether in, they're in a creative industry. However, usually there are a lot of misconceptions about these two topics. So... When we think about creativity, I actually segment creativity into three ways. The first, we can talk about the output or the creative product. We can talk about the offerings, the, the things that people put out there, whether it's an artwork, whether it's an app, whether it's a pair of jeans, whether it's a new dish, whatever it is, we can talk about creativity in terms of the products that people create. The other P of creativity, though, is that the creative product does not materialize out of thin air. Creative products, whether it's a product or a service, whether it's tangible or intang tangible or intangible, digital or analog, creative products are brought about by a rigorous step-by-step -step process. So the second thing I'm going to talk about in a while would be the process of creativity. The third P of creativity, though, I feel is the most important P, because this is the primordial creator, the person that fuels, that catalyzes, that spearheads the creative process so that a creative product is assured. So the third element of creativity is you, the creative person. So let's talk about these three um, uh, three pieces of creativity. If we are to truly create creative products, it can't be chamba. It can't be um, uh, by pure luck. In other words, we need to know what creative products look like. Think about it. 
how can you create something if you don't know what that something should look, feel, and uh, how it should appear? So the first thing that we need to know would be the characteristics of creative products. Now, when I think of creative products, I think of this lemon juicer and how uncreative and boring it is. What is creative would be this lemon juicer by Philippe Stark. Now, assuming you have one lemon and you slice that lemon in half and you use that first half on the lemon juicer there, the boring one, and then you use the other half on the Philippe Stark lemon juicer, I assure you the quality of juice would be the same. However, if they're priced the same, I bet you, you will choose the Philippe Stark lemon juicer. When I think of creativity, I'm reminded of all those realistic looking paintings like this of uh, a traditional night sky. And I find it boring. What is creative would be this night sky by the great Vincent van Gogh. When I think of creativity, I think of all of those bands that are boring because they have your typical band setup. You have four or five people who can play the in different instruments and they just do those things. What was creative or what is creative is this band, Gorillaz, a band that is composed of musicians and cartoons, a band that for every time they make an album, the musicians change. It's an ever-changing roster of musicians, totally different from your traditional band. In other words, the first element, in other words, the first element of creativity is that creative products, creative offerings are always different. That's the first thing you need to remember. It has to be different from all the things that have been done in that field and also all the things that have been done in your organization or your own personal history. However, being different is not enough. I know you guys know people who are unique, who are different, but are irritating and annoying. So being different is not enough. When I think of creativity, I think of the first, the first light bulb made by this guy here at the back named Humphrey Davy. His light bulb, okay, he was the first light bulb ever, but his light bulb, after it lit up, after a few seconds, that light would just die down. It was pointless. Here you will find, I will, you see Bill Gates with the first personal tablet computer launched by Microsoft in collaboration with Fujitsu. But this tablet was no different from all the computers out there. It didn't have a compelling proposition for people. What were creative were Thomas Edison's light bulb and the power supply, the power plant, and the electricity that he created out of it, and Apple's iPad. In other words, it's not enough to be different. The creative product, the creative offering, the creative idea should deliver. It should make people's lives better. It should deliver on personal goals or corporate objectives. Now, those two are your standard definition of creativity, novel ideas of value. Again, the creative idea should be different and should deliver. However, I add a third component to creativity. When I think of creativity, I'm always reminded of Sesame Street. I grew up on Sesame Street. I'm sure a lot of you guys also grew up on Sesame Street. Now, Sesame Street was just, if you think about it, an education show. But what made Sesame Street creative was that it educated us using visuals, colors, catchy songs, interesting, funny mascots, and interesting and engaging characters. It made learning fun. When I think of creativity, I am reminded of Disneyland. When you enter Disneyland, Ah, it's a multi-sensory barrage. What you're seeing, the characters that you grew up on suddenly are there as real life mascots. What you're hearing, the songs, the things that the cast members say, what you're smelling in terms of the food and also the attractions and all of these things. In other words, creative products need to delight your senses. It needs to engage your sense of taste, touch, your auditory and your visual senses need to be engaged. 
Think about it. The gateway to one's emotions would be their senses. So make sure that when you're creating something, you are delighting people's senses. So that's the three Ps of creative products. Creative products need to differ. Creative products should deliver. But more importantly, creative products should make people shiver in delight. Now, as I said, creative products don't materialize out of thin air. But it's important that you guys know what the criteria of creativity is so that you know what you're striving for. Now let's talk about the process, the creative process that leads to those products that I mentioned. One of my favorite, I guess a lot of people love also would be the Beatles. And one of the greatest songs of the Beatles would be Hey Jude. And let me tell you how Hey Jude came about to illustrate to you guys the creative process. So there was, um, Paul McCartney finding out that his best friend and his bandmate, John Lennon, was going to divorce his wife, Cynthia Lennon. And he realized that their son, this little boy, Julian Lennon, would be left um, with a broken family. And, and Paul McCartney just felt so bad for this kid, Julian. And he said, you know what? I need to appease, I need to care for and nurture this sad little boy. So that started off the creative process for the great Paul McCarthy. All creative pursuits start with a catalyst. In this case, the catalyst for Paul McCarthy was, I want to nurture and to care for, to comfort this sad little boy. Then he moved on generating ideas. So according to Paul McCartney, he said, I started singing, Hey Jules, because his name is Julian Lennon. Hey Jules, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. And he continues, it was optimistic, a hopeful message for Julian. Quote, unquote, I know you're not happy, but you will be okay. So there you go, a germ of an idea. He soon brought in his writing partner, John Lennon, to further refine the idea. Right away, they found the name a bit clunky, I guess, and they renamed it Hey Jude. And you can see there the whole lyrics coming about. So then they're defining the concept, which is the next stage of the creative process. Soon they brought it into the studio. They were actually in the process of, of uh, doing the White Album. And, and then all the band members started trying to um, get their two cents worth into the song. Supposedly, George Harrison said, let's add some electric guitar and all of that stuff. So they were trying to incubate and refine the concept. Paul McCartney felt against putting some electric guitar there, whatever, until finally they agreed on something which brought them to the last stage of the creative process. Finalizing the song, it didn't make that album. It didn't make the white album. They had to release it as a single, the single that we all know and love, Hey Jude. Now, that's an artist, that's a musician going through the creative process. The same process can be found in the world of management, particularly how Art Fry, the guy here of 3M, created the beloved Post-it note. So what was his catalyst? Art Fry, aside from working in Post-it, or in 3M rather, he was a church choir member. And in their regular practices for the church choir, he found an annoyance that really bothered him. As he was practicing the songs, he would put loose leaves of bookmarks inside his songbook. And when he would open the page, the bookmarks would fall all over the place, preventing him from keeping track of the songs they were practicing. So that was his creative inspiration, how to practice or how to make sure that he can keep track of the songs better. Then he moved back to going back to work. He found out that there's this other guy in 3M, the guy to the left named Spencer Silver, who created a so-so semi-adhesive glue, a glue that was not permanent. If you think about the 3M, it's about great gluing. There are the guys behind the scotch tape, the duct tape, the masking tape. But this guy created a semi-permanent glue. And the idea sparked inside Art Fry's head. Piece of paper, semi-permanent glue would solve his problem. And then similar to 
Paul McCartney and the Beatles, they started refining and incubating the, the, the new idea. They had to come up with a coating to make sure that the, the new paper would stick but not leave a residue. They tentatively called it post and peel, and then they gave it out as samples to everyone nearby until they found out that the executive assistants found it super useful, asking for more as they printed documents and put that post and peel on those documents. Finally, they launched it as the post-it note that we all know and love. So those two examples, short as they may be, different as they may be, one coming from the world of music, one coming from the world of product development, reveal to us the basic creative or the innovation process. Again, you start with finding or framing a creative objective. This is called the inspiration finding stage. What will inspire you to create? What will inspire you to innovate? Those are the questions that are being asked in this stage. Once you have a powerful creative objective, then you move on to ideating. Sometimes you can ideate many ideas, different concepts, different potential solutions that could solve, obviously, solving your original objective. Then you select, you refine the creative product. That part is called the incubation stage. As you incubate, you could probably test it with different people until you refine the idea in a much, much more powerful way so that soon you can launch and implement the idea. So again, inspiration finding, ideating, incubating, and implementing. The four stages of the creative process. Now, some people, some people are naturally good at ideation. They just ideate out of nowhere. And that's fine. You can start with the second stage, but if you do so, it'll be helpful to go back to move to inspiration finding and ask yourself, this idea, does it satisfy a good creative objective? Does it satisfy a consumer need, for instance? Or would it have an impact in the market out there? I always say, one without the other, an objective without an idea is an unfulfilled promise. An idea without an objective, though, is a directionless and probably pointless concept. You need those two together, a powerful objective and a great idea. Only when you have those two can you move on to incubation and obviously implementation. Now, now you know so far that creativity has two components, the product, and that product should be different, should deliver and should delight. Then, the creative product is brought about a process that goes from finding an objective, ideating on that objective, incubating those ideas until you finally implement. But as I said, as I said earlier, the most important part of the equation would be the person, the prime mover, the creative person that is behind the process with the intent to create that creative product. So what would be the characteristics of the creative person? Actually, there are so many things that we can talk about um, um, with regard to the creative person. But for our talk tonight, um, I just want to talk about two characteristics of the creative person. Usually, one misconception about creative people is that they're simply right-brainers, that they're just right-brainers. And when you're a right-brainer, you're, you're all about new ideas. It's all about novelty. Um, you can easily imagine possibilities. You are, um, you are bored with the status quo, that you want to be irreverent and all of these things. And that's true. The right brain is where these um, thought processes reside. Another part of the right brain would be our ability to connect, to empathize connect with people, which is very, very important in terms of creativity. Just go back. Just remember the story behind Paul McCartney being empathetic, saddened by the fact that Julian Lennon was now going to be in a broken family. So the empathy of that person should be there. 
creative people are definitely right-brainers. So these are the two personas of the creative person. The creative person is an, I an ideator, but also a connector. However, however, a lot of people may not realize that great creative people are also disciplined left-brainers. Just remember those two people I mentioned earlier, Art Fry and Paul McCartney. If they were not left-brainers, they wouldn't have been able to select the ideas that were important. They wouldn't have been able to implement down the line. So on one hand, in terms of left-braining it, creative people are analytical too. It's very important to be analytical when it comes to creativity. Why? Because when you're ideating, for instance, and you're ideating many ideas, you need to be able to analyze, to critique, which of my ideas would actually deliver on my objective. That's a level of analysis that's needed there. Also, as you connect with people, for instance, you're talking to people, you're trying to figure out your, their irritants, what, the, what are their needs and all of these things, chances are you would be swamped with a lot of insights. So the analytical mind would allow you to prioritize those needs. So definitely being analytical is important. The other part of the left brain though, that is very important in creativity is that you need to be able to implement. And in implementation mode, you're now looking at the fine details. You're now looking at the next steps, the programs, the activities, the tasks that you need to do in order to make your idea a reality. So the four personas of the creative person are that the creative person connects with people. He can connect with people, he can empathize, he can see what people need. And from those insights from that level of empathy, he goes to the left side and analyzes and prioritizes which of these insights are of importance today. And from there, he goes back to the right side and ideates new ideas new concepts, new possibilities, and then again analyzes which of these ideas are good. Finally, he goes on to implementation mode. In other words, the creative person is what we call whole brain. Okay? The creative person can use the different facets of thinking from going macro and looking at the blue skies of things all the way down to the micro detailed level. The creative person is both left-brained and right-brained. Another thing that characterizes creative people, I've researched and interviewed different kinds of creatives, entrepreneurs, innovators here and abroad. And one of the things that I notice is that they have a tendency to be easily bored by their main field or their main interest, so much so that they dabble in so many other things. They dabble in so many other things. I call, that they, I call that connecting with different environments. And, and I found out from research, I actually spoke to a, a learning psychologist in the States, and he said that when people dabble out of their normal status quo, when people pursue a change in routine, and when you are dabbling in other environments, basically you're changing your routine, automatically your brain changes and it just becomes much, much more creative. There's a study even that you become more creative, sad to say, because we can't do this now. Whenever you travel to a new place, people become more creative. Why? It's that change that they experience. They get moved out of that funk, their traditions and they are able to ideate more. So here, personally, I'm just showing you an image that is representative of my own varied interests, from film to music to art, et cetera. Make sure that you're always challenging your status quo. Now, just to summarize, creativity is such a very interesting topic, but definitely, definitely big, definitely profound. I tried my best to, to talk about it in, in this short talk, but we can look at creativity in three Ps. The creative product, now you know, creative product should differ, deliver, and delight. I want you guys to use that as a criteria from now on. 
anytime you're doing something, try to ask right away, is this different? Will it deliver on my needs or my customers or my audience's needs? And then finally, will it delight people? Again, the product will not materialize if you don't have a process. Finding an objective, ideating on that objective, incubating, and then implementing. Finally, the last part of the creative formula is the person. And that creative person is not a one-note tango type of person. He or she is whole-brained. He can easily be excited by the newness of things, by imagining stuff, being very right-brained. However, they are equally left-brained. They're holistic thinkers. So with that, thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So yeah, so we have enough time for some q and I'm just curious, maybe I'll, I'll start off today with my own question lang. Um, Sure. There are some people who are uh, who consider themselves um, left brainers, like those who are very analytical or whose jobs are quite in the analytical stream, right? Uh, maybe they're in finance or they're in uh, accounting or something like that. How do they now um, be a little bit more creative? How how do they inject creativity into their sure. Not maybe necessarily their line of work, but that is possible. Um, but sure. how do they develop the right side naman of their of the brain? Mm -hmm. Actually, my favorite um, my favorite audience to teach. Whenever I, of course, and this is the toughest audience too. Whenever mm -hmm. I hear my audience would be, yeah, what you mentioned, finance people, <laughs> bankers, or coming from operations and really left brain and. Uh, um, functions and endeavors, I get excited because um, it's, it's tougher on one hand because, uh, as you mentioned, right, they're coming from fields that are traditionally very rigorous and they're very um, status quo oriented. However, I get excited by it because um, when you impress upon them and they get excited and they realize, rightly so, that they can be creative too, then the impact is much, much more profound. Now, um, to answer your question, I, I realized I realized that although there may be much, much more things that cannot be changed in those fields, right? Because there really are rules in those fields that are, are untouchable. There's always going to be facets of their day-to-day -day work, their basic um, processes that have room for creativity. I realize that whether it's their policies or sometimes it's their way of doing things, um, processes, their throughput, the steps that they go through, you can actually, again, you just look at it from those three, uh, those three criteria. Can we do things differently? Have we, been, um, have we been so comfortable in this tradition that we haven't challenged it uh, in the recent years? So looking at it from that perspective or if you combine the, the second D, can we deliver better? Can we shorten the time? Can we shorten, can we, can we reduce the cost and all of those things? So um, on one hand, I assure you, there are always certain tasks, certain policies that can use some creativity. Mm -hmm. Now, your second question though um, is easier because you said, yeah, if, if they're not gonna do it in their own field, how can they be creative? So what I mentioned earlier, right? Like. Um, um, having creative pursuits outside their work would really sharpen their right brain. Um, so again, if you look at the right side of the brain or the tasks associated with right brain thinking, uh, it's really about opening up to people, uh, listening to your uh, internal and your external stakeholders and audiences' needs and, and wants and all of that. So that alone is being right brained already. Right? It's being open to, to new possibilities by listening to someone else. And then imagining new possibilities. Again, it's also a right brain endeavor. So for, for, for left brainers or left brain uh, um, functions, those are the ways you can do things. 
Okay, so left brainers, may pag-asa pa kayo maging creative. Okay. <laughs> but uh, by the way, um, again, I, I forgot to mention. Whenever there are ideation techniques that are naturally left brain, by uh -huh. the way. So another thing that I do when whenever I have a le uh, a set of participants that are naturally left brain and traditional and whatever, I give them techniques first that are very rigorous, that are step by step. That's all about breaking things down and analyzing things. But the end goal is to create new ideas. So that's one thing that I also want to impress upon people. There are techniques to create ideas, to ideate that are appropriate for your thinking style. Right. Great. And, and, and I think, you know, knowing that is, is uh, very reassuring because even though you are creative naman on the other side, parang you know that it can still be honed. You know, that there, That's there, true. when you get stuck in the creative process, or let's say when people feel that they're stuck in what they're doing and they need to push forward, at least you know that there is a way to, to, to fix that or a way to be more creative or techniques that can help you hone that skill of creativity. So it's not just, uh, you know, oh, that guy is talented or that guy is sure. gifted, right? Or that, per or that woman is gifted, you know, that person is gifted. So that's true, though, because, you know, like I... I I just uh, rem I, I was just reminded of how there are quote unquote creative people, successful artists coming from really creative fields that get so burnt out, right? Mm -hmm. That that they that they end up finding you know what this is routinary as well. So even the as you mentioned the quote unquote right brainers also need in the, you know also need uh, techniques or interventions or activities that would balance their uh, their proclivities <laughs> okay i like that word proclivity <laughs> <laughs> okay let's let's go to a question naman from uh, uh, the comments that we're getting from some of our viewers and this one is from Mary Lou Romano so how to draw the line? How do you draw the line between creating products that delight people to that of pleasing people? Because while the first one produces pleasure, the second one is most likely to produce stress. Okay. <laughs> pleasing and delighting? Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm... where do you draw the line now between okay. products that delight people to that that please people? So I... Okay. That, I don't know if there's um, much difference, uh, but <laughs> I know I, I I'm a bit uh, also um, maybe if if she can clarify later on, okay. but yeah. maybe uh, to 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 answer it from how I understand it, no? um, you know, when we talk about uh, creating for, and I'm assuming here, let's say again, we have to nuance this. If you're an artist, if you're uh, a filmmaker. Um, Pleasing people might not be your number one criterion, right? Because there's a totally different thing there. So let's assume that you are um, a company and you're creating products or services for customers, let's say, wherein uh, pleasing your customers is of utmost importance. Um, on one hand, pleasing people, I, I interpret that as delivering on their needs, these are my needs. These are my basic needs. Um, if, for example, I am buying, um, I'm buying, let's say, uh, um, a cup of coffee, I have basic needs that I am expecting from that cup of coffee. Those are the bare minimums. Mm -hmm. So every company, every creative, every entrepreneur needs to deliver on those base minimums. In fact, you cannot, you cannot, uh, compete and differentiate on base minimums because, you know, those are basic expectations. So on one hand, you're able to deliver on the basic needs. And this is where delighting will take you further. That's why those three criteria are important because they need to be integrated well. You may be different, but you're not delivering on the needs. So, you know, you need those two. But those two, being different and delivering, I find are no longer enough to truly create powerful 
products or services or interactions or organizations that truly engage. When I talk about delighting people, it means you're really taking into consideration their deeper emotions. What are their deeper emotions? What are their long-term aspirations as people? You know, so it's not just, for example, delivering the base minimums of what they look for in a coffee, for instance, and going the extra mile, right? Delighting them means, oh, for example, one of my favorite examples is um, certain, certain brands of wine. And if you think about wine, it's basically uh, an experience in terms of taste and the scent. Those are the two uh, senses that wines would engage in. However, great wine companies actually invest an arm and a leg to have well-designed labels. You have labels designed or um, um, yeah, labels designed by Picasso or Miro or, or Warhol. Why? What for? It won't make the wine any better, right? But, but making people delighted by seeing it, even before they open that bottle of wine, they're already being engaged. So it's, it's that um, level of care and um, thinking that, hey, my product is not just the literal the literal delivery of it, it's wine, therefore you drink it, you smell it, that's it. But these guys think bigger than that. But the person will see it, the person will hold it. Why are we not engaging them along those lines? And you have those companies that say, you know what, we're gonna delight them in terms of all of those levels. So there. Okay, great. Uh, and and that, that's very interesting, no? because then now it, it brings to mind that, you know, Maybe it for let's say marketing or people who are into uh, the process of rebranding, you know, it, it really has to go deeper into the psyche of the people that sure. will, um, that will experience either your product or your brand, right? That's wow. true. Okay, great. So uh, next question is from uh, Jet Cornejo. So do you feel creative people generally want to follow the creative process? Do some of them think that it limits them? Uh, well, <laughs> nice, very nice question. Um, you know, I realized, uh, I realized that, that consistently creative people, consistently creative and also um, ano, ah, successful <laughs> Uh, successful cre creatives in any field, in any field, whether it be management, art, uh, music, um, film, let's say, they really have a process. They really have a process. It's not chamba. It's mm -hmm. not chamba. Now, there's a, you know, one of the, one of the classic cliches, if you, is you cannot break the rules unless you learn the, the rules. Um, that's one of the paradoxes of creativity that, Again, the left brain, right brain thing, right? It's a balance. You need, you need to have structure. There's always a level of rigor that you follow. Even the most radical movies, for instance, even the most edgy movies will always have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Not necessarily in that order, though, as what they say, but there's always those three acts of a narrative, right? But it's up to the person to jumble it but still have that semblance of narrative. So great creatives um, know that you need to have, I call it a loose framework. You still have to have a framework that, that you follow, but you play around with it. You push it. You, and that's, that's actually, a lot of creatives actually like that. Um, there's a saying, right? I need a deadline. There's a saying in a lot of a lot of advertising people would say, "I need a deadline, otherwise, I you know it'll never end." Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I I know where where the question is coming from because when we hear of a process, a quote unquote process, we feel that it'll box us in. However, the process is there really um, not in terms as I said earlier. Some people go and jump into the idea process right away. Yeah. So it's not going to be that linear. Then you can go and ask, okay, what's this idea for? Who is it for? What will it solve? So it may not be that linear, but you still need a semblance of process um, to, to play around with. 
I guess it's more like uh, having a guide, you know, like guide posts so that you know exactly, uh, exactly. You know what to follow at least at, at a certain point, right? It's not like yeah. you're um, so that you don't come in blindly also in terms of your own creative. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Actually, I, again, like, yeah, those guide posts, um, if you look at, for example, directors like Quentin Tarantino, right? Mm-hmm. They, he, would, he would use the guide posts, the conventions of a genre whether it be whatever, gangster or whatever. And then he would really play around with it, with a yeah. guidepost. But they're there, you know, they're there. So, right, yeah, that's true. Really. That's, that's a good example now. No, he, he does do that. And uh, in most of his movies, you'll see that, that there is some kind of a, a genre or a theme or something. Uh, yeah, always. He always starts with a genre, right? And and when you never, whenever you have a genre, it means you have conventions. And then he's going to play around with those conventions. All right, great. Uh, next question. Uh, this is from Milan Seriosa. The challenge would usually come in during the implementation process, since we yes. need to work with other people to be accountable in the process. So what is the best way to ensure that we become successful? Uh, that's, that's true. Um, so whenever I do, let's say, an innovation workshop for a company, I always make sure I, I, I you know, so some of them get, get excited after that, only to find out when they start implementing, they face resistance um, from the people who didn't attend mm-hmm. uh, the workshop. So one way is to make sure that everyone's on the same page, that they have the same language, that people know where you're coming from. When you're starting to, 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 to disrupt the status quo and when you're starting to ask, why are we doing this? How come we haven't asked whether or not what we're doing is still relevant? All of these things. When you start doing that out of nowhere, every person would get weirded out by that. So you need to make sure that the person that you're going to engage with, whether it's in incubation and it starts in incubation, even in the first stage, ideally you're going to start there already. So make sure that they're on board, that they're on the same page. Um, if you can uh, bring them into your process better, much, much better. Now, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, um, I always tell this to, to participants of whatever. I tell them, you know, you have to ideate ways to win over and to solve the resistance you would face. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest lamentations of people, right? Ah, oh, you know what? Person, a certain person or certain rules in the company will prevent us from implementing these things. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cliche of a complaint because it's true. So I always tell them, then, if you know already that you're going to face that, ideate already your plan on how to win them over. That should be part of the implementation plan, right? Identify already. Identify the existing hindrances. And the hindrances could be people, departments. It could be existing policies or existing um, cultural behaviors in the company that might prevent you from implementing. So as early as... Uh, possible. Try to identify these hindrances already and then plan for them. So those are the two ways. One is make sure that people that will be involved in implementation are on the same page. They know where you're coming from. And then second, even if you know already, there are certain people that would be resistant. We all know that. Then plan ahead. Nice. Great. Ideate on them. Ideate. <laughs> Actually, parang you're ideating on both sides. <laughs> yes, you know, yes. On how to uh, satisfy, if you already know who you're going to talk to, you need to be able to True. ideate in that sense how you're going to satisfy the possible questions or maybe the yes. questions that you might encounter. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, all right, next question. I have, uh, well, there are two questions that are kind of similar. So I'll just put them together. One is from Anonymous. The other one comes from an Ayakui. So I'll start with Anonymous. With the current situation in business and economy, uh, what advice can you give to apply innovation and creativity to help survive the changes? Similarly, um, Ms. Ayakui asks, in their tutorial hub, uh, it now goes online because of the pandemic. So it may need 
a lot of right brain skills this time, which she does not have. Any advice on how to do this, having uh, or being a left brainer? So I yeah. think they're they're kind of similar, right? So what are sure. things that you can do to innovate in the current situation? Yeah, push forward your businesses. And at the same time, how can a uh, our left brainer also apply these things? Okay, the first question is very rich. No, there are so many ways to answer that question depending on the context of the person asking. Um, you know, because there are so many possible segments, right? It could be you're in, in an organization that has been badly hit by the pandemic and, you know, there's not much more to expect in that industry. So that's a totally different innovation um, formula or innovation intervention there. There, it will be new business opportunities, finding new possible ideas for that person, for that organization based on their existing skills, based on their competencies. Maybe they have certain assets or networks or, or existing strengths in that organization that they can draw upon to come up with a new idea or a new uh, venture altogether. Totally different from a company that is still in existence but greatly hampered by the pandemic. And, and there, um, you know, in, in, in ever since uh, COVID started, I've actually had this uh, um, term called Covinovate, no? Parang innovation uh, during COVID. And there, there to Covinovate, there are many ways. Um, it could be innovating based on your, your, your target market, uh, recontextualizing your target market and seeing what if I change my, my or what if I adapt my product for COVID affected markets or whatever, you can go down the marketing mix and tinker and, and, and tweak it, apply ideation techniques there. Um, so totally, totally, uh, there's a lot of possible ideas um, in, in our, uh, with our students in the Graduate School of Business in Ateneo, the entrepreneurs there, different, different ways of coping in terms of the pandemic, whether you're B2B or B2C, totally different uh, nuances there. But the common thing is if the need is new in the strategic level, new products, new company ideas, or a new business altogether, I suggest what you need to do there is really opportunity seeking. So looking at customers that are there that may have changed in terms of needs and then generating a new business idea and all that. So that's big, big innovation that is needed there. However, if your organization is still in, in existence, the industry is not obsolete, it's just greatly hampered by, by the pandemic, then it might be more on the business model, supply chain, and the tactical marketing components. Now, for the second question, though, um, in a way, it's similar to what we said earlier. Um, I like the fact, I like the fact, though, that she recognized the need to be whole-brained because she's saying that she's left-brained in nature, no? And she's saying, I guess, and, and that's what I like about if there's one thing to come out of the pandemic is that people are much, much more aware of their own vulnerabilities and their weaknesses and the need to change. And, and I think that person might be one of those people that are uh, that is more aware now. So kudos. Um, now, as I said, there, you know, there are actually techniques and ideation that are perfect for left brainers. Uh, so again, what do left brainers like? What are left brain activities anyway? Again, analyzing, breaking things down looking at microscopic details, tinkering, right? Testing. These are left brain activities, hands-on experimentation. Those are left brain endeavors. So um, what you can do, again, when you're looking at, the, at, at your, so she said tutorial center, no? so to be specific, she can look at all the things that she does, break down, break down the customer journey of her students, break down the different touch points of that tutorial center as it goes online and then try to see what can I make, what can I, what can I change here that'll be more different, that will deliver, it will delight in all of these things. Um, of course, when they watch um, the, my, my video and Pocket Mentor, you'll see all of the ideation techniques there. Uh, 
promote. Ah, yun, <laughs> and then I say, Gui, thank you. <laughs> it's actually there, no? So I'm being objective. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, um, you know, because nowadays really, it's like people have been forced to into that creative mode. Um, yes. And I'm not saying that they've taken up baking or something, right? Uh, <laughs> that's good. Cool, right? To get a new skill is good. Uh, that's true. No matter what. It now actually forces us to rethink moving forward because yeah. it's so easy to get stuck in the, in the reality of things and then see it from the light of being like, oh no, my business is like this, so what will I do? I, I mean, I can't that's do true. anything, right? It's so that's easy true. to get stuck stuck with that but you know if we just think outside or within or if there's no box whatever that is yes we can actually reshape that and and think about moving forward that somehow this brings us the the new normal somehow has brought us a, an opportunity an opportunity yeah, that's true to, to you know evolve into something maybe much better and more adaptable yeah. in the future that's true yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the cliche is that for every crisis, there's an opportunity. And, and that's true. I, you know, like even, even um, people like me who um, is a facilitator, a consultant and all of, uh, you know, a, a speaker, I've never imagined um, before having three or four different talks in one day, for instance. <laughs> yes. But Zoom affords us that, yep. right? Um, and, you know, I also, I also realized of course, when, when ECQ struck, right away, I had to immerse myself in doing webinars and online classes and all of these things. And I tried to make the medium sing. So I would, I would experiment relentlessly on the functionalities of Zoom or whatever. And I realized there are things that I can do on Zoom that I couldn't do in a face-to-face -face class in terms of engaging the students, for instance, right? So in, in a regular online class, of course, this is different because it's a one-way webinar type of thing. But when I'm having an online class, for instance, I can flash a video and right away ask students to comment on that video as the video is playing. I would hate that in a regular class. <laughs> You're showing a video and people are talking. You'd hate that, right? Yes. But yes. here you can do that. You can yeah. use polling. You can, you can, you know, there's so many things that you can do that you couldn't do in a regular face-to-face -face class, which goes to show that this pandemic can really make you much, much more creative. And there are actually opportunities that were not there before. That were not there before that are now available available to us. Agree. Okay, so let's move on to some other questions. Um, okay, again, uh, itong si anonymous is very famous. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, from the three P's of creativity, is there one that should be focused on first, or maybe more important than the other? Well, you know. Um, Obviously, if, if, if I were to choose, it'll be the person. Mm. When, I was, um, when I was writing my first book on creativity and innovation, what I did was to interview different people from, from different fields, advertising people, artists, entrepreneurs. I interviewed psychologists here in a book, whatever. And my entry point was just... I would just ask them, how did you come up with this idea? How did you come up with that idea? What is your process and all of that? Because my intent was to abstract, to distill the process of creativity. However, I found certain people say, you know what? I don't know. And some of them, and they were not being arrogant. They were not as if, wala akong proseso. I just spew out creativity. No. In fact, some of them were embarrassed na parang chamba yata eh i don't know i just it just came out ganyan and then when i you know like of course when you're writing a book you're desperate i'm like dihirap naman ito wala akong masulat right so i just i just ask them and ask them about their lives about their whatever their habits until it struck me that those people have achieved what i call creative muscle memory 
creative mas in 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 sports right muscle memory is michael jordan 10 seconds down the line he doesn't need to think when he needs to win it'll just kick in muscle memory will kick in he knows what to do yeah and i realized that certain creative people have creative muscle memory it just comes out of them but i said teka lang wala silang proseso then i realized why it became muscle memory similar to athletes because they have practiced it to death, right? And, and, and that's what they said, right? Like, you know what? It becomes muscle memory. I don't need to think because in practice, I've already practiced all possible situations. Mm-hmm. So what is, crea- what is that kind of practice for creatives? You know what? It's really what I mentioned earlier exposing, immersing yourself to a variety of environments. Mm-hmm. So I, the people I spoke to, Chef Gene Gonzalez, I spoke to him. Uh, uh, and, and Chef Gene Gonzalez, a known culinary uh, uh, mastermind, but he was also seriously dabbling in fencing, for instance. So much so that he became a national athlete winning medals for the Philippines. And I asked him, does fencing make you a better chef? <laughs> and all of these uh, creatives that I spoke to, even Marlon Rivera, uh, all of these people, they have, they have other environments, they have other interests that they seriously dabble in. And, and I found out if you do that, it just makes you more creative. So that's one. Um, the most important is the person. Because the person, as I said, I keep saying, I kept saying earlier, it's the primordial creator, right? So if the person um, has immersed so much in the process, I mean, you know, hindi naman yan ha- it won't happen overnight, right? So you 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 practice it, you amass the skills, the tools, etc. But you also immerse in the field that you're in, that you're producing for. I tell you, the ideas will come out. The ideas will come out. The Great. person will become naturally creative. So there. All right, great. Um, so our producer has a uh, message that we only have about nine minutes left. So maybe okay. we'll answer, maybe let's answer two more questions. Sure. Um, okay, the first one here is again from, I know, from uh, Milan Zeriosa. She asks, what is the most effective platform to engage people in an organization to encourage creative people to share ideas. Mm. <laughs> Maganda yun. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say a platform. Um, you know, I'm assuming she wants it to be more cultural, mm. that the organization has a culture of creativity. And, you know, I noticed um, in, in some of our clients and some of my, um, my, my work, um, it's really having dedicated rituals, dedicated rituals that are planned, that are scheduled. Hindi pwedeng ano lang eh, hindi pwedeng sabihin mo lang eh. Kailangan talaga you carve out the boundaries or the lack thereof. You set the boundaries or the lack thereof so that certain beliefs and behaviors are really operationalized. No? So one of my favorite examples of this one of the biggest companies in the Philippines, they have one group just in charge of employee engagement. And what we did for them is a nine-month innovation laboratory. So for nine whole months, at least once a month, their entire team, 40 people, are pulled out of work. Pulled out of work. You can't say, I have to do something now, etc. Et no, because it's the three bosses and the big, big boss telling them, don't worry, we're going to pull you out. Diba? So, so the bosses are walking the talk. And as I said, ritualized. Every month, one whole day, we will go through this innovation lab workshop or whatever. And that's one whole day with me and my team, etc. And not only that, it's not as if we have one day, we'll give them exercises to implement all the things they learn on their company. So in that whole month, binulabog namin sila for a minimum of two, three, four days. But it's the bosses telling them and giving them that time that, you know what, you will not be ridiculed, you will not be um, scolded if you do all of these things. So there. So it's really giving them um, 
a ritual, a, a, a scheduled ritual we're in. People are so yon, you, they're free to share. Yes, okay, they can pero talagang put it in in a in a in a schedule. And then obviously award them. If you say that new ideas are important here, okay, then put your money where your mouth is. Mm-hmm. Implement those new ideas of those people. So yon, right. you, you ritualize it, you ritualize the behavior, but you also award the output. The output. Award the output by not necessarily monetary, awarding them by implementing what they came up with. And soon people will be will realize, ah, okay, it's really seriously taken into consideration here that ideas are welcome. Nice. Okay, last question. Ito, favorito ko to eh, kasi, <laughs> uh, and you have like uh, two minutes to answer it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, ito, tinatanong niya, si Anonymous ulit. Is there a way we can apply the creative process in our own personal life? Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, oh, oh. So personal. Um, right? Yes. Um, I, you know, it goes without saying. Definitely, um, it could be big. Uh, it could be big uh, decisions, life decisions that you can do it uh, in. You know, the whole four stages, huh? The whole four stages of the year. The person might be looking for a, a new a new life, right? A totally, totally reinvent his or her life. Pwede talagang the four stages. However, these techniques um, that they will, again, that they will see in our video uh, in Pocket Mentor, <laughs> these ideation techniques, you can, you know, even my kids, some, I, I, I used to, I used to use uh, these ideation techniques to come up with ideas for a new toy, for a new monster, or whatever, or or um, you know whatever. It can be applied in a variety of contexts, mm-hmm. your right. life included. Yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess the processes and even the the three Ps. You know, like you were saying a while ago that uh, sometimes it's. Uh, if there's one thing that you choose, it's really people, right? Yes. I guess that's, yes. that's something that we can apply in our lives that, you know, before we make any decision or anything, any drastic creative change, we look at the people and, you know, mm-hmm. what is what would delight you and them at the same time. So, galeng, yeah. All right, great. Um, so, may nagpapa shout out ba? All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> Wala bang dedication? Uh, Kinakamusta ka raw ni uh, Bryce Fabro, Hi Sir A. Okay, so para lang may isingit lang natin yun. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank Aaron, you, Robbie. For being with us here on Pocket Mentor Live. Um, and uh, guys, uh, I think Aaron already mentioned it a while ago to all our viewers um watch out for that pocket mentor app because uh we'll have Aaron as a pocket mentor there and not only him but we have more and more people who will be there uh sir francis kong is also going to be on that app uh giving you valuable bits of learnings and information so we will formally launch that app soon just watch out for it watch out also for our next live event it will be posted also here on uh, the Facebook page on uh, or Pocket Mentors Facebook page. So for all of you who are avid followers and those who just invite people, you know, to come so that they can learn something new. I mean, I learned something new today from Aaron uh, about creativity and how that can impact our lives. And, you know, if you're a left brainer, it's OK. You can still practice that skill. So if there are other skills that you want to learn, Pocket Mentors right here for you. So thank you very much again, A. And uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And this is Pocket Robbie Zialcita speaking for Pocket Mentor. We're signing off. See you in the next live session. Good night, everyone. <laughs>